Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Great to have you in on Thursday. It's Hale Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, he is back. Elijah Herbal is in studio. Can find and follow us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio for Chris Schmidt at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. Sir, you are out of uh, the bubble wrap. Good to see you. Out of the health and safety protocols. <laughs> the, uh, the, the team mandated health and safety protocols. I'm out like a phoenix rising from the ashes. You, uh, you, you ran out of there. You got that little break in case of emergency hammer and started chipping away Andy Dufresne style. And all of a sudden... Uh, four football fields later, you're you're back in studio. Good to see you. Oh, it's good good, good to be back. I was so you're much bored. more tan than I. Re- I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> than I remember you. <laughs> a little fatter too, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not <coughs> feeling well. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you, you wouldn't believe how many times I had a little cough and then COVID at home. My roommates didn't think it was funny at all. No, well, my wife does that to me every day. She comes home from the hospital. She'll snuggle up and go. <coughs> And yeah, so that's yeah. that's that's hilarity right there. <laughs> We're uh, busy today. Brandon Vogel, HaleVarsity.com and magazine managing editor, going to be with us. We will hit some football with him and Husker volleyball. Vogue's also, uh, of course, did the book with John Cook, Dream Like a Champion. In hour two, we'll get Coach Barnett's takeaway on the uh, NCAA investigation on Nebraska analysts and unauthorized workouts and all of that stuff what is what's going to be the kind of the new normal for nebraska while you await whatever the ncaa comes up with and then former husker hall of famer and uh, kansas city chief a lot of years with kansas city eric warfield one of our favorites uh, Warfield's going to check in with us, talk about uh, Nebraska's secondary, his uh, teammate and friend Scott Frost, and uh, some thoughts on the NFL. 466-3776-4663776-800-825-5865. On a quick note, Brandon Vogel, HailVarsity.com, a really awesome breakdown and preview. You need to check out, you need to subscribe, HailVarsity.com backslash subscribe. Uh, to get that digital content and, uh, of course, the uh, the new, uh, well, the, the subscription to the magazine, Lexi Sun on the cover, uh, wearing some shades. So it's, it's a really cool new issue that is out to preview Oscar Volleyball. So where to begin, Elijah? Uh, kind of a whirlwind yesterday with uh, the presser, with Trev Alberts, with Scott Frost. I gave you my thoughts. Uh, some things we'll get into today. We'll get into football. Yes, I know most of us are ready to move on, but a couple of, of points before we move on. One, a uh, really good story from The Athletic, David Ubin. Uh, David, uh, well, formerly of ESPN, so he's been on with this before, but he has a really uh, pretty poignant story on that buyout beware uh, if, if you're Nebraska. So we'll get there in a moment. But former Colorado and Washington coach, and, and he went to, to court for wrongful termination when he was at Washington because he participated in a, uh, an office pool for the NCAA tournament. It was like five grand, and he won it. And, 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 and Neuheisel's just a different cat. He's on ESPNU uh, twice a week, Sirius XM. And, you know, he's, he's an entertaining listen, and he's always just – kind of survived not the greatest head coach had a couple of memorable seasons he's the one team and one guy that beat that legendary Miami team if you think about the Ed Reed and Edger and James and uh and 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 Sean Taylor squads from from 99 through 01 well his 2000 Washington Huskies took them down in Seattle so that was kind of Skippy's, and that was my nickname. That was our nickname for him in college because he was coaching at Colorado. Uh, he, he was just kind of a, an oddball, but, but somewhat entertaining. He'd play, uh, he'd play this uh, acoustic guitar, fireside Thursday night somewhere in Boulder. A lot of granola. 
uh, former UCLA quarterback, and, and it wasn't Wonder Boy and it wasn't Slick Rick. I settled on Skippy, Skippy New Heisel, <laughs> this blonde haired guy with a marble red voice. And, and he's doing radio, long and short. He's coached at UCLA. He's coached at Washington. He's coached at Colorado. Left Colorado for Washington. Didn't end well his final two stops. But he has a take here on Nebraska. Specifically, uh, his angle, his thought is, all right, uh, Nebraska outed themselves. His thought, his read, and his experience is unique because he did battle a, a former employer, and New Heisel's also a lawyer, and, and he knew that they wrongfully terminated them, and he got a payday. But Slick Rick seems to think that, that Nebraska's starting the ball rolling on trying to move on from Scott Frost based on yesterday. I don't think so, but it's not a, a crazy theory. Here is Rick New Heisel, his commentary on Nebraska. There's, there's only one person that's going to say, oh, my God, you can believe this. And that's inside. Yeah. They have decided they would <laughs> rather go in another direction. Yep. And they have ba- basically outed themselves. And, and, and that's why Scott Frost has to lawyer up. Listen, in this story, they also say it was Scott Frost trying to get rid of the Oklahoma game. Right. And, and Bill Moose had to kind of, you know, walk it back and take responsibility, which is probably why Bill steps away, because he's the one who upped the ante with Scott. Remember when Scott was going through trouble, they re upped the deal, added years to the contract at five million per. Nebraska cannot stand the fact that they are behind Iowa State right now. And I've said it. It's one of the most amazing things I've seen in college football in my time that Nebraska, which I started cut my teeth as a head coach and with Colorado, Nebraska. Saw him win three national titles. I mean, I'm like, I'm sitting there going, "Holy smokes!" They are now behind Iowa State as a program. First of all, tip the cap to Matt Campbell and everybody at Iowa State. But second of all, what the hell? And now they have decided, as you read the tea leaves, they need on. to move on, and and yeah. they are they are they basically the buyout, blowing up their own guy. I can see that. I can see that that angle. I can see that math on it and you know there's there's a lot of different factions and elements within nebraska right would it be beyond reasonable doubt that maybe there's some boosters with a lot of money that want to move on is it solely because of on-field performance or do they not like the head coach has has he rubbed them wrong have they rubbed him wrong you know you you get that circle of, of booster money hypothetically and, and those dudes and gals want to want to kind of be in the inner circle. They want to rub shoulders, rub elbows. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, to me, Scott's done a, a few public engagements. Easy enough guy to get along with. But is it is it a performance thing? Do they see the handwriting on the wall? Do they see 12 and 20? Do they see sloppy football? And do they drop the dime? That, that's kind of an ongoing question. You know, how, how did this investigation begin? And, and we'll eventually figure that out. Vic off the top rope early and often. Chris at HaleVarsity.com. New Heisel is a miserable, well, it rhymes with Rick. Uh, and isn't he a lawyer? Thought, thought so. He's a weaselly bastard. <laughs> Vic, Vic, funny. Uh, but no, I, listen. Do you have cyclone envy? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, you wish Nebraska's nine and three. Okay. You wish Nebraska's beating Oklahoma. You wish no- TCU and Oklahoma and where Iowa State has climbed is incredible. It's temporary because eventually Campbell's going to leave. He had three offers from the SEC last year. Detroit wanted him. He said no. He's happy. And his buyout's nine million or was to, to pry him away. And, and he, he, he gets it. There's like three or four programs that are worth leaving to go to, and everyone else is kind of you know, clawing and fighting for inclusion to the playoff. I don't know that there's Cyclone envy. I think you can appreciate where you want to be where Iowa State's at. You don't want to be Iowa State. Nebraska and Iowa State are apples and oranges financially. Iowa State's always had to kind of outkick their coverage, quite frankly, for hires. And Jamie Pollard's done an awesome job between basketball and football hires. I don't think there's cyclone envy. 
Uh, Nebraska needs to get to where Iowa State is. And once Nebraska does, if Nebraska does, they'll, they'll sustain it longer than, than Iowa State typically or traditionally has. Right? I mean, so no, I, I think he's off with the Cyclone Envy. You can compare the programs because they're both in the Midwest, but not the history. Now, yeah, is there some is there some Hawkeye issue going on? Yeah, you'd love to be where where Iowa's been at under Kirk Ferentz in Iowa, and their wins and their comp their, their competitive level, and the fact that they've been in the the top twenty five or top fifteen, or gone to a conference championship quite often. I mean, uh, it's just one conference championship run. But the point is, is Iowa's always in it in November, knocking on that door. So I think he got the wrong Iowa. Elijah, your takeaway here. You think New Heisel's off? I think there's parts of this that can make some sense, but I think he's well off with the Iowa State envy. Well, he says it like it's some sort of coup from within the athletic department. I don't think that's it at all because you, you there's look, been you look that, at, there's been that theory out there though. But and you, a couple you look of, at the moves that have been made because I mean the people who okayed these extra practices and these guys being on the field were I mean you look at it the guys who are now gone Lambrex and Moose. Both those guys are now gone, and those are the people that were kind of in direct oversight of what Scott Frost was doing, and now they're both gone. Do, do I think it was like a – I don't think it came from either of those guys. Like, I just don't know who it could have come from. Is there, Maybe is somebody there some within, sinister inside mafia hit going on? It, it just – it doesn't make much sense to me because especially you go, well, if you're getting this NCAA investigation to get this buyout waived – who is going to want to come here and coach at Nebraska? I mean, that's been the discussion before. Is if Scott Frost isn't the guy, who's going to be the guy? Who's going to be the guy, especially if you're saying, you know what, Scott, thanks, but we want to get rid of your buyout too before we let you go. Think of this. You're already the program. You're already the university. You're already the athletic department. Not the same guy, but the same entity that's whacked two nine-win coaches. Okay. That in itself kept the guy like Urban Meyer away when there was openings. Mm -hmm. Coaches get how difficult and insane it is to win eight, nine, ten ball games. So, A, you've already got that garlic necklace around you. You're the program that's fired two nine win coaches. Now you're going to go take your own son, your own golden boy down. On, on a technicality, allegedly, through a buyout to save 20 or $25 million? I mean, it's smart business to try and get out of it, but it's not a guarantee, which leads us to, to David Ubin's story with The Athletic. You can't, you can't compile that. If you're, if you're Nebraska athletics and Nebraska football and you're trying to get this thing out of shallow water, the rudder anyway, you can't be the program that whacks uh, two nine-win coaches and then <laughs> snuffs out a guy's walking away money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's, that's the wrong trifecta. Now, to the buyout beware, Kansas went after David Beatty for $3 million. And that eventually, because Beatty lawyered up, that's why Scott Frost is lawyered up, just in case. Beatty ended up getting $2.55 million of the $3 million he was owed. Kansas came out of that thing so underwater. It would have been easy to pay Beatty this $3 million to go away. Instead, they said, no, nah, you, you, you com- committed a minor NCAA infraction. That's cause for, uh, for conduct. That's, that's cause for us to be able to, to, to keep our money and it was it was with cause you're gone and yeah you were garbage on the field anyway but in court Beatty won 2.55 million and then Kansas with legal fees and uh, this this law firm that came in and investigated the drum up charges uh, was, was tough the same lawyer who represented Beatty is representing Jeremy Pruitt Tennessee's trying to get out of out of the 13 million dollar buyout they owe Pruitt. They fired Pruitt for cause. And he'll probably be somewhat successful in recovering a portion of that money. You can't do it. And you can't look for reasons to let go of a guy because you made a bad hire that didn't work out. And and the courts are are so far one for one with the with the uh, the David Beatty example from Kansas. And the other part here is if if you want to 
bring in more action to save yourself some money, it could end up sinking other sports, right? The the wolf could come to the party. Uh, and you, you could find a lot more violations in other sports, and it could turn into a forest fire with different sports, and that will cost you revenue, that will cost you coaches, that will cost you recruits, that will cost you wins. And, and I especially look at the fact that Jared Lambrick is gone, who's the football chief of staff. It doesn't make sense to let him go if your end goal is to end up firing Scott Frost as well, because that just gives him the ability to pass the buck and say, yeah, I was told from my higher ups that this, what I was doing was okay. And I mean, I I don't think that that lends itself well to being Scott Frost was at fault for these NCAA violations. If he can pass the buck, you, you as head coach, it it is your job to know all and and be a thousand percent eyes dotted T's crossed. But if, if your advisors have told you it's okay. Sure. If you check with people, a, a couple of things working for Scott Frost. Lembrecht's gone. Two, how much was Bill Moose around? Right? So, and, and Moose is gone. So, those guys have, have moved on, and, and now it's Scott Frost. And I think it's a good sign, Trev Alberts and Scott Frost, at yesterday's Face the Music moment. Brandon Vogel's next. It's Hale Varsity. We're presented by the Nebraska Lottery. And we're back. Fellas. Think we could listen to the radio listen? on Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes, that's awesome. Thanks for spending time, Hale Varsity Radio, with you on a Thursday, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, and Gary Barnett coming up here in about thirty-five minutes. We say hi to managing editor with HaleVarsity.com and magazine. And author with John Cook, Dream Like a Champion, Brandon Vogel with us at Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter. Vogues, how's your Thursday, bud? What's new? Oh, it's going pretty well. Not not a whole lot new, so still sort of processing everything that came down yesterday. But, you know, not much more than a week now, and we'll play some football. I can't wait, and we will get deep into football and volleyball Quick take from you on yesterday. How do you think this investigation began? Any theories? Hmm. Um, no, nothing Nothing that solid. I mean, anytime you get into this sort of thing, and I think, I think the nature of the allegation kind of lends itself towards that. It can kind of come from anywhere in terms of, you know, former, former coaches, former players that were involved, like – not to not to make light of the fact that Nebraska is being investigated by the NCAA, but these these analyst roles seem to be a spot where almost all of these schools run the risk of running afoul of the rule by law. I mean, most Power Five schools use them, and I'm, I'm not trying to minimize it to any degree. It's just it's like, yeah, this is kind of what happens. You bring on an analyst, they probably do a little more than is, is allowed, and it's just a matter of who notices. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, I think there's plenty of extracurriculars. If you go back to accusations from Harbaugh to Ohio State to the Detroit yeah. Free Press story today on, on Michigan and, and, and their guy that's working with their Russians named Ozzy to, to now Nebraska is being investigated. What did you make of, of, of Trev and Scott together yesterday? I mean, I thought Trev showed leadership and, and I thought he forced some accountability. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the right way to put it. You know, um, really anybody can get up at sort of their introductory press conference and say, "Hey, I'm available. Call me if you have questions. Text me. Um, let me know. I, I'll get you an answer." And you know, and this this is a situation where you can't provide all the answers right now, um, which I think everybody understands. But even just showing up and being there and making a point to say, like, we're here, we acknowledge this, and we can't tell you a whole lot right now, but you don't have to go and text me individually to say, is Nebraska, in fact, being investigated by the NCAA? He showed up and said that. Um, indicates to me that all of the stuff that, that Trevor Albert said in that int- introductory press conference was not just him saying it. Like, that – it, it – 
yesterday said to me it is legitimately important to him, which which is which I think is a big deal. Um, it, it says something about um, the future of Nebraska athletics, I believe. So, did much come out of that press conference? No, unless you want to get into the sort of the body language of it, um, which which kind of rose up and, and smacked smacked you in the face a little bit. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a big body language guy, but you, you kind of couldn't help but notice it. Um, so, you know. <laughs> The, the allegations, the investigation, however you want to term it, is what it is. It's it's not a big deal on its own. It's only a big deal if it signifies something larger, I guess, is where I'm at 24 hours later. Now, Brandon, do you think that this could be – I mean, a lot of national media people have been speculating this is something Nebraska could try to use to get out of the buyouts uh, of Scott Frost's contract. What, what's your take on that? And, and do you think it's, it's a black eye for Nebraska if they do try to use this to, to get out of their buyout for Coach Frost? I don't think – and this is solely my opinion – I don't think anyone is actively working behind the scenes to set the stage for a reduced buyout specifically because of the second thing you mentioned, I do think it would be a little bit of a black eye uh, on Nebraska if that were the case. You know, you can think back to really the the, the soulish departure and the, the fiasco that that became to, to find a new head coach where I remember people saying then, like, who wants to take this job when Frank Solish just got axed for going 10-3? and three? Now, Nebraska under Scott Frost hasn't been close to 10-3. and three, But still, you know, he's, he is from Nebraska. He is a beloved figure from his time as a player. And to whatever degree people are dissatisfied with the past three seasons, that is what it is. But I have a hard time thinking that things have gotten so bad that Nebraska is actively working behind the scenes to reduce this payout. Like, if that's where we're going, if it's a year from now, if it's five years from now, I, I, I just don't see a scenario where they say, yep, uh, there was this NCA investigation for, as far as we know, illegal use of analysts, and that's enough to fire you for cause, so we owe you nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like there would be more good faith involved, even if none of this went according to plan. None of this went how any of us any of us thought it would. I mean, Bill Moose left as the A D in a surprise retirement basically a week before that became effective, which never happened, and got his full payout. So it, it's just hard for me to imagine that someone's like, Yeah, we're gonna tip off the NCAA to this being the first step in us getting out of $20 million at some point down the road. You can't be the program that whacks two nine-win coaches and then doesn't pay your guy if it comes to that on his way out the door. Exactly. (laughs) Impossible to bring in somebody that can go win you eight, nine ball games uh, at some point. Brandon Vogel's with us on Hale Varsity Radio. Vogue's to football, incredible piece by you, HaleVarsity.com. On the offense, let's take things in. And uh, the title's perfect. The execution of all things, my friend, as you preview the offense. Tell me the easiest way for Nebraska to score more points. Um... The easiest way would be to – this is a tough question. And, I mean, I've looked at this extensively. Um, the easiest way would be for them to engineer a little bit better field position, which may not be the most exciting answer, but field position um, – and Tom Osborne said this at some point when he was new on the college football playoff selection committee. Like, field position is kind of an overall health check on your team. Like, are you consistently gaining an advantage there? And Nebraska hasn't. Like, its defensive drives have been too short. Its offensive drives have been too long based on where they've started from. So so what that means is both sides of the ball have to work harder to prevent points or get points than they have. And it's, it's tough to pinpoint one single reason why that's the case. It's a little bit of all of it. 
it's a little bit of Nebraska being turnover prone. Um, it's a little bit of Nebraska being turnover unlucky on defense because they forced a lot of opportunities. So I think that would be the broadest way to look at it. I mean, if, if Nebraska's offense has one of these seasons where maybe turnover luck turns their way a little bit and they just turn it over fewer, that's the quickest way to get there to, to get to more points. The other way is being better when you cross the opponent's 50. We're not even talking about red zone specifically, but just turning more of those drives into touchdowns or points. And the easiest way to do that is through more explosive plays, which I think really, if I were to boil down the 2021 season, is the biggest missing ingredient. If I were like, oh, if you just add this to Nebraska's offense, it takes off, it's explosive plays. It's, it's the biggest difference between what happened at UCF under this staff and what happened at Nebraska so far under this staff is like they keep, they consistently gain yards. They're efficient. They stay ahead of schedule, which is all good. Like it, it may be the most important thing in a vacuum because you're consistently putting pressure on a defense that way, but they've lacked the, the big plays for the most part, or at least they've lacked them consistently mm-hmm. And last year, the the biggest culprit was the passing game. So as we talk about a new receiving core, as we talk about Adrian Martinez looking as good as he's ever looked, if that translates into more big plays in the passing game, I think you could see this offense take off. Vogues, that that was nails. And, I mean, it's it's a puzzle you just put together for us, kind of the, the domino set up here. So as we look at Nebraska – and explosive plays and field position, all of that. Do you think Nebraska is equipped to to be balanced enough to do it? Meaning, is it going to be, well, the run game's got to pop more, and I think of of, of a Zigbo, take a drink, right? I said a Zigbo on a Thursday. But I think of his big (laughs) runs in 18, or I think of Stan, right? I mean, you, you you want to be able to be balanced in, in how you you go about it, so it's not it's not difficult on on your offense. You need you need the run and the pass to do it. Yeah, I think I think um, I think that's the starting point. The Nebraska's run game is still its best foot forward, and and that's kind of remarkable when you stop and think about it because Devino Zigbo, you you know you just mentioned him, like had a great close to that 2018 season. But early in the year, Nebraska was still kind of cycling through guys, kind of like what we'd expect for 2021. And then it was like, no, this is a guy who, like, sees it right. Like, our O-line can block it well enough that when he's like, okay, I I need to cut here, this is where I go, and he got it done. I don't know. I mean, Nebraska hasn't had that guy the the past two seasons. Like, Dedrick Mills was better than he was given credit for, Mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, it never just fully snapped into place. And we don't know, you know, if if it's going to snap into place in 2021. Nebraska has a lot of good options, I think, at at running back. We just got to see him play a little bit. And if, if they have that, you can do that through the run game. And the great thing about that is Nebraska's already somewhat accomplished there. They're already better than the national average. Like, if there's one thing you can lean on, I would say it's the run game. Um, if you do that, it opens up that passing game so much more. And, and then you're starting to talk about sort of the option off of offenses we remember from Nebraska, or we see today with basically the service academies, where if your run game really works and really works consistently, the big plays in the passing game are going to be there. So can Nebraska get to that point? It's kind of their path of least resistance forward, I think, in terms of offense. Vogues, I need five more minutes to talk volleyball. Can we do it? Yep. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Kind enough to give us a second segment. Managing editor, HaleVarsity.com and Magazine. Author with John Cook, Dream Like a Champion, some champions uh, getting ready as training camp going on for Husker Volleyball. Vogues, we talked uh, a lot of football. We'll get more into football. 
Uh, the uh, cover woman for Hale Varsity is Lexi Sun. Really awesome article and feature on her and the Husker Volleyball preview is out. So what what are the expectations? What are the realities for, for Coach Cook and this squad? Yeah, for me, um, so back when we thought 2020 could possibly unfold, like uh, – <laughs> everyone had on a normal schedule, I guess this is the best way to put it. Like, you know, expectations were pretty high for Nebraska. They, they had lost to Wisconsin in the regional final in, in 2019, but they brought back everybody and you're like, okay, well, if you, you know, everybody gets a little bit better, um, you, you hope to go a little past that. And then the season was canceled and then not canceled and then moved to the spring, all, all of that stuff. Um, and and they lost to a really good Texas team in the NCAA tournament. So then the question became, well, are you going to get how are you going to get some of these seniors back? And Nebraska got the two that are I think most vital to their their future success in, in Lexi Sun and, and Lauren Stiverens. And Jacob uh, Padilla did a great job with his feature on that, kind mm-hmm. of looking at how all of this kind of came together for, for Lexi to play again. And, you know, the, the name image likeness stuff, which we've seen her be very active on so far, um, was a part of that. You could be, you know, the first person to, to really take, take part in that uh, as a college athlete. I mean, among the group of the, the first people, but we all knew right away, just based on kind of the passion for Nebraska volleyball in the state, Lexi's abilities as as a great player and also her social following that you could just kind of pick her out of the lineup and say, oh yeah, that's someone that's going to do really well in this arena. And so that story goes into that a little bit and, and more about kind of coming back and what this season could be for Nebraska and, and what it means and, and, and why you choose to, to stick around for a sixth season. So it, it goes into a lot of about Lexi, but also big picture stuff for Nebraska volleyball, which got two seniors that it wouldn't have thought it would be starting 2021 with. And also uh, welcomes one of the best recruiting classes in, in, in history and any sport at Nebraska. So it's, it's super interesting uh, when you talk about storylines for the upcoming Husker volleyball season. Brandon Vogel's with us. Husker volleyball preview is uh, is this recruiting class comparable to the old Michigan Fab Five? I mean, kind of, kind of go a little deeper uh, to to what Coach Cook not only did, but what's available. I imagine training camp is fierce because of the young talent versus the old guard still wanting to keep their spots because nothing's guaranteed. Yeah, I, I, I think I don't think the, the, the Fab Five comparison is, is inaccurate. You know, when and this is in Jacob's story in the magazine for this August issue, when Lexi decided she was coming back, which was, you know, back in the spring, Coach Cook was like, Great. Um, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to win that spot. Because, and I mean, he didn't, nobody said this in the story, but you can kind of read between the lines of like, hey, I recruited as if we weren't going to have you. <laughs> so just so you know, that's what you're trying to overcome. And as, as you know, for this, the, the, the red white scrimmage this weekend, you know, it, it gets intriguing at a couple of points. I think Lexi Rodriguez, a, a true freshman um, libero, who's, who's coming in, that kind of position battle between her and Kenzie Knuckles, who has played a lot of volleyball for Nebraska, will be pretty interesting. Uh, Nebraska has some things to sort out at outside hitter where Lexi plays. But the bigger thing might be, well, Lauren Severance is going to be a little bit delayed in her, her return to the team, is what happens at, at middle blocker. And, and Nebraska's in a pretty good spot there. They've got two people in, in Kayla Caffey and Callie Schwarzenbach who have played a lot of volleyball and are both, you know, legitimate starters in, in their own right. Are they going to be pushed by, by one of these freshmen? That's one of those spots that I think will be really interesting to see on Saturday, which is how Nebraska divides up these teams. 
Brandon Vogel's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Brandon, what do you make of Nebraska volleyball being rated number five in the preseason poll? Do you think they're going to take that as a slight with all the returning talent and this great recruiting class coming in? I would have thought that previously, but I don't now because at, some, at, at, at a point where we were working, where I was working through the book with, with John Cook, um, which, you know, came on the heels of a pretty similar season where Nebraska fell a little bit short of the Final Four um, playing for a national title and returned to everybody. I, I kind of messaged him at one point, and I was like, what's the deal with these ABCA rankings? He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, they basically just go off last year and adjust a little bit. So it, it has forever altered where teams start in, 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 in these ABCA rankings, which isn't to say it's not a value. It's, a, it's of incredible value, um, particularly for a sport like volleyball, where you know the people paying that close of attention to it are, are fewer than, than a lot of sports, unfortunately. So number five, like that's probably, that's probably about right where for, for where, what Nebraska earned over the past last season, but really the past two seasons. Um, and you know, it's, it's a unique year where everybody has the potential to, to return everybody. You know, the, the most interesting thing was that Texas still, jump frog or leapfrogged uh, Kentucky in my mind. Um, you know, in a typical year, I think Kentucky kind of gets grandfathered in. It's like, well, they won the last national title, so they're number one this year, particularly in a year where you know they can bring back everybody if they wanted to. Um, but Texas jumping up there indicates to me that, yeah, Texas probably has a pretty good amount of talent returning, which nothing new on that front. So, I think five is, is a pretty good spot for Nebraska to be. I do expect that Cook, that Cook will probably push some of those disrespect buttons, but <laughs> you do what you got to do. Vogue's 30 seconds. The Big Ten's loaded again. Who's, who's the next up-and-comer in the Big Ten? You've seen programs that are traditionally great, and then you've seen many rise up. Who's the next riser? Yeah, so Wisconsin was was up there at number two, and then Nebraska in the top five. But the one that stood out to me was was Purdue, and it's been a little bit of a you know continual rise for them. I think they had their highest final ABCA ranking uh, two years ago, where they finished seventh. They opened, I think, at number eight in in this year's rankings. Like that was an indication of. You know, so you, you've got your Nebraska's, you've got your Wisconsin's, you've got Minnesota. Those are probably, well, in Penn State, sorry, the, the top four. Um, and occasionally we've seen Illinois get up there. I think Purdue could be the next one. Um, and that'll, that'll be one to watch as we, as we venture forth into this 2021 volleyball season. Well, thank you for the overtime. Thanks for the volleyball chat. Great to talk football and recent events vogues well we'll check in saturday appreciate your time bud sounds good thank you chime in 402-466 espn or email the show chris at hailvarsity.com just try me try me back to hail varsity radio one final time 10 minutes away gary barnett his take on nebraska's situation with the ncaa and uh, we'll examine some of his thoughts on tweaking and kind of peaking an offense. Eric Warfield, Husker Hall of Famer, Kansas City Chief, will dive into some NFL and uh, Husker football outlook. Specifically the secondary here, the last part of hour two, 466 So Terry Pettit, le- legendary Nebraska volleyball coach, on Twitter earlier this morning, and folks were trying to interpret what uh, Coach Pettit was saying or who it was directed at. And this was a pretty good tweet because Terry Pettit's a pretty smart guy. Sometimes people ask me why Nebraska volleyball is so consistent. The answer is simpler, not easier than you think. John Cook gets up every day and goes to work without distractions and tries to make Nebraska volleyball better. It works like compounding interest. That's so right on. 
is have that uh, compound interest accruing, and it's built on day after day after day after day. So easier said than done to wake up without distractions. You've got a lot of distractions the last 48 hours. If you're football waking up, you can't let it become a distraction. Your job is to, to get practice handled and do their thing. What you, what you think uh, of kind of the O-line depth and situation here? Uh, Turner Corcoran will know when we know uh, where he is at, but you, you got Brad Banks that's, that's worked at guard or tackle. Uh, Sichterman looks to be the, the dude at right guard. I know buddy of yours, teammate Brock Bandos, really fought well. And, uh, and I think there's going to be a, a multitude of linemen that get rotated in. It's going to look, or it could look, uh, similar to some of yesteryear where by, by a third or fourth series, you've got some guys that are getting game snap time uh, no matter where the score is at. Well, I, I mean, I think I feel better about the depth along the offensive line than any other position on this team aside from maybe within the secondary, and I still think I feel better about the depth along the offensive line. Obviously, the Turner Corker news is bad just because he's a young guy and all the snaps you can get in fall camp are, are super beneficial. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it's just as important to get other guys in and get them continuity along that number one offensive line because offensive line is a position where you really do have to expect injuries. I mean, people roll up on you. You're going to sprain ankles. You're going to hurt your knees. Things are going to happen along the offensive line. And uh, I-, I wouldn't even call it super i'd call it borderline impossible that you're gonna have the same five starting offensive linemen for every single game for all 12 games in a season so i think it's really important uh, to be able to get those reps in fall camp obviously it's not great that turner corcoran isn't able to get those reps right now as he's down hurt but i think it's awesome that brant banks is stepping up into that that number one spot he's getting reps uh alongside guys that he's probably gonna be playing with uh this season i mean it's not uh out of the question to think Brant Banks could start multiple games this year just because you hear Greg Austin rotates guys from tackle to guard uh, and even from guard to center. So it, it makes sense, and it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, uh, and I, I think the the prospects of what we've seen from these backup offense linemen have been very good in the past couple of years, and I, I don't think I feel any less comfortable about any guys along the, the second group of offensive linemen than I do along, uh, along the first group. Sichterman's a good story. I mean, in, in beyond the story part, he's – He's stuck with it. He stayed at it. He's been here a while, and it's paid off for him to earn to earn that spot. So as you look left to right, you have Corcoran or Banks, which is good. Piper and Cam, and uh, then you got Sichterman and and Ben Hart. Pretty nice setup for Nebraska. Hour two on the way with Hale Varsity. Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. It's Hour 2. It's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We welcome in the Hall of Fame coach, Gary Barnett, Colorado and Northwestern, exceptional golfer and legendary uh, smoke man for a barbecue. The uh, the rib-off uh, trophy in hand. And coach, are you still able to putt as you're carrying that trophy around? <laughs> Well, the trophy wasn't very big, uh, so I just I leave it. It's a stationary trophy that <laughs> stays at the house. So there's no Stanley Cup element to it. Okay, I no, get you. I no, get you. No. Well, uh, what's going on? How uh, how you doing? You, you fired up? Your ball's just around the corner. Boy, it is. Uh, I've been to most of the uh, practices at CU, and then of course watching everybody and reading up on everybody. And this time of year. You know, I think I told you I used to walk away from that uh, media day lunch and thinking, man, we're not going to win a game because everybody's <laughs> really good. And right now, everybody's really good. A uh, few injuries are popping up. I know Colorado lost maybe its, its potential starting quarterback to a, wow. just a non-contract, non-contact knee ACL. And, you know, those are starting to show uh, themselves all over the place. But... Uh, yeah, I think, what, we're eight days away or something like that from uh, Nebraska and Illinois. Yeah, I can't wait for it. We'll leave, we'll leave Thursday to head up to Champaign. It's being billed as 
Well, we've we've hit on and we'll hit on next week, hopefully, just how big a game it is. But, Coach, in the meantime, uh, some drama with Nebraska football. That's uh, not a surprise, but this sort of drama is. And that is uh, the NCAA is in Lincoln or has been in Lincoln. An investigation uh, is, is underway, ongoing. And yesterday, Trev Alberts addressed that briefly with not much detail, and, and that's – all well and good. He, he at least acknowledged it. Scott Frost was there, didn't look thrilled to be there, but uh, he was front and center along with Coach Albert or with, uh, Trev Alberts. Coach, I wanted to get your take here on, on the first part of this, uh, specifically when it comes to what's, what, what's alleged, and that is the, the, uh, the on field analyst or the, the the analyst being on field is how I should deem it, and then the extra practices. How serious do you look at, at, at both of these accusations when it comes to 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 stepping on toes with the NCAA? How how big or how bad can these charges be? Well, I I think the uh, allegations of uh, analysts and consultants. Uh, being involved with practice, uh, uh, you know, it looks to me like if they have video coverage of this, that that's sort of a no-brainer that there was a violation. I don't think it's a serious violation, and I don't think the NCAA will treat it as a serious violation because in, in reality it's one of those things where, you know what, everybody else is doing it, they did it, and they got caught. And so – whether the NCAA is aware that everybody else is doing it, I don't know. But it's very difficult to have all those consultants, all those advisors, and not have them on the field watching what's going on and giving you an opinion. And so it's uh, it's one of those things when they start allowing it, everybody knew that, that there were abuses. And that's why the NCAA book is so thick is because – People abuse it. So it is an abuse of, of the rule. Is it a serious, you know, whatever level it would be, high level? No. And so I don't anticipate that being a big issue. Um, I think what it does, it's going to probably make every other compliance officer in the country start looking to see who's on the practice fields. And, and I can tell you that I've been on practice fields in the last 10 years where that sort of thing is going on. So uh, Nebraska isn't the only one. The other violation of, of having illegal practices, that's a more serious thing. But I, you know, again, I think we're going to have to wait and see what the NCAA really finds out there because it's, as I listen to Scott and hear him say that he had approval to do whatever they did, and I'm not sure what they did, but, you know, then, then I think that's a contestable uh, allegation that may not have anything to it. I think if it ends up being true, that carries a little more weight with it than, than the other one. Uh, neither violation are close to what's going on in Arizona State. Mm. Now, does that make it any better or any, you know, any less severe? No. A violation is still a violation. But I don't see this as being a serious violation for Nebraska. Gary Barnett's with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Coach, how does something like this come to light? The million-dollar question is who and how did this investigation begin? Any any theories? You've been around college football a number of years, and, and you hear and have seen a lot of things. Well, it's usually a disgruntled employee or somebody who who all of a sudden got really pious and decided that uh, they needed to do something and usually it's it's a it's a level employee and that, that's not like a coach it's not like a guy that's in that room and understands what you're trying to get done and how you're trying to get it done and how serious it is and how you know really <laughs> involved it is and in the trenches, it's usually somebody just outside the trench that's watching it and and feels as though it's not everything is kosher. So mm-hmm. my guess is it was someone like that. It, you know, in any case, it really doesn't make any difference who turn it in. It does make a difference whether you're right or you're wrong in the situation. And if you're wrong, 
you know, then then you're going to have to pay the price for that. I don't think it's a serious price for that one, but I'm I'm guessing that someone will have to pay a price. There's a theory out there as well that that maybe this could be the initial steps down the road to to trying to to figure out a way out of Scott's contract that things don't turn around. You know, uh, Chris, I look at it this way, and I, and I understand that, and I can see where people are coming from with that sort of deal. But you know, every great story, every great turnaround, every great accomplishment is always so much better if there's a lot of hardship and adversity. Our Rose Bowl year, for example, was was really only a great story because we hadn't been there in 49 years. We had a player get killed. We had all that sort of stuff go into it, and everybody loved the story. Nobody likes the story where Alabama wins all their games, beats everybody by 25, and wins the national championship or whatever. So I look at this as the opposite. I see this as a great opportunity to have one of the great stories of college football this year, to overcome all this sort of stuff, to fight through all the adversity, and that's that's how you talk to your team, and that's how you talk to your coaches and your supporters, and um, whether or not this is a chance for somebody to think that this could be a way to get rid of Scott, not pay him, uh, you know, that's going to be for the courts and attorneys to determine if that should get to that level. Mm -hmm. But I see it the other way. I, I think it's just another piece of adversity that Scott and his coaches can turn into just one of the great stories of 2021. Well, the distraction part with the NCAA or outside drama, two weeks ago you talked about that 90-10 ratio, right? Right. And something like this on top of the mounting pressure for the opener, do you have any – I wonder what that percentage is at right now. I mean, it sounds like camp's gone, gone well. It sounds like they've been physical. It sounds like they've got some dudes. Uh, and, and you've got a really experienced coach who's done well in the, the Big Ten waiting for, for his kickoff, right, at a new football program. I just wonder how, how things are going with uh, some of the, the upper-level management there uh, with football. How, how, how ready can you keep the team locked in? Can you yourself stay locked in when there's stuff swirling? Well, you, you know, the, you don't really worry about upper-level management. That's not your issue. Your, your issue is... You're 120 players and your coaches, your, your group, the guys that are going to lock arms and go to war with each other in eight days, that's the, that's the percentage that's got to be 90-10. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's, it's just a very great opportunity to say this is just what I'm talking about, that you know, if this percentage goes beyond 10, then, then we're looking at an average, average season. If this – if this percentage stays at 10% of internal issues, then we, we got a chance to be a really good team. And so, you know, the locker room, the, the leaders in that locker room have to have to sit down and have a discussion with all the other players. Coaches can only do so much in this deal. Coach, well, what's your take on uh, on self-imposed sanctions by a school whenever there's NCAA violations? I mean, we've seen in recent years a lot of schools have gone for it, and it doesn't really seem to me like it's been the, the best route to go. I mean, maybe morally, but like I look at a school like Baylor, who just a month ago, uh, less than a month ago, uh, got off pretty scot-free from some pretty serious allegations. Um, and then I look at Nebraska 10 years ago. Uh, they had some issues with, with giving players too many books. and they went, Textbooks, Elijah. And, and they went down yeah. the, the self-imposed sanctions route, and it seemed like they got a stiffer punishment than what than what Baylor got. So, what's your take on the whole self-imposed sanctions? Uh, you know, I would not I would not be in favor of self-imposing unless it was something that was so obvious that someone had to make a statement about something. And so, and then you do have a moral obligation, and then you just got to live with the consequences. But you know, I, if I were if I were Nebraska, I sure wouldn't do it at this point in time. I mean, from what I have seen, and I don't know everything. Just probably just as much as you guys do. Um, it looks like it's been tamped down to me a little bit, mm-hmm. um, so I, I wouldn't do anything. I, you know, especially in light of the only one that looks like a violation is consultants and and um, you, you know whatever the you know the other guys are that are doing it. So uh, 
you know, I, I wouldn't do it. I agree. And, uh, you know, Baylor's, Baylor's allegations were not NCAA violations. They were more ethical violations mm-hmm. than anything else. And um, so I, I think that's, that's what happened there. Gary Barnett's with us. A couple of minutes left, Coach. A uh, thought here on, on offense. I want to get your take. Everyone wants more explosive plays. Uh, how do you get them? <laughs> how do you go about turning an offense that that is either not doing what what you want field position wise, but uh, say you're you're starting out a little bit further away from the opponent's goal line? How do you uh, how do you get those explosive plays? How do you go to work in the lab and, and make it a reality? Well, uh, you know that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. <laughs> the, the first answer is players. Right. You know you got to have explosive players. You got to make have game you know, difference makers in positions of carrying and getting the football. Uh, that's number one. And then you've got to be willing to, you know, to, to take the risk and the chances that it, that it takes to have those kinds of plays. Sometimes you get them in, in just the simplest of offense. I mean, in 2001, when we were, we had a lot of big plays, they were just plays that were just well blocked, good plays. And, you know, we made a lot of yards with them, and it wasn't a very complicated scheme. Mm-hmm. Um, others, it, it just comes down to the playmakers you have on the outside. And, uh, uh, I mean, that's that's something you can't really go create. You'd like to, and everybody wants you to, but you just can't go into a lab and come up with a bunch of big plays. It's, it, it's a combination of scheme and players. It and is play calling. By play. The way. Well, and, and tell me about that. Tell me about the uh, the, the play calling uh, aspect of it. Just knowing when to to dial up uh, a play action, or or okay, here's what we saw on film. Here's what we know defensively. Uh, the other team likes to do. Uh, let's let's really try and hammer and get that outside zone going. That that art form that is play calling. It is an art form, and, but there is science to it because you have to have the stat. And then, then you have to, you've got to be committed to a scheme. And I think those guys who, who play around and change their schemes and move from one, one scheme to another each week, uh, those are the guys that don't get the big plays are the ones that are always looking for the big plays. The guys that get the big plays are the ones who have done their homework. They know the, they know the numbers behind the percentages, uh, and yet they've hammered in the scheme so soundly that everybody knows what to do and everybody can play fast. When you get players who can play fast because they know what to do on every play, that's an art form of simplifying your offense, understanding what you're playing against on defense, in other words, knowing the numbers Mm -hmm. and and doing the technical uh, task of of knowing exactly what those percentages tell you, and then the art form of putting all those together with play calling. So you know, it, 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 it's it's not a science, and it's not pure art. It's a combination. Coach, how'd we shoot today? We know it got rained out. We're down here at Castle Pines, which is a Ooh. beautiful golf course, and we got rained out the last five holes. So, oh man, doing okay till then. Now, I I, I called like fifteen golf courses. I finally got on Saturday morning. So I'm I'm smiling finally, but <laughs> too many tournaments, man. Too many tournaments going on, and. Well, everybody's playing golf, Chris. No, I know. It's going to be 83 and just fantastic. Well, uh, tell that rain to go away and, and uh, hit them far and straight uh, tomorrow. Coach, thanks for the time today. Great being with you guys. Take Later. care. There he is, Gary Barnett with us. Good perspective there with the NCAA Nebraska's trek forward and uh, what you do offensively, getting more points, getting more big plays. Some black shirt love coming up. Eric Warfield, Husker Hall of Famer. Kansas City Chief will dive into some NFL as well with uh, Warfield next. And we're back. Fellas, you think we could listen to the radio? On Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Yes! That's awesome! Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Let's talk to Husker Hall of Famer and standout uh, member of the Kansas City Chiefs. For so many years, Eric Warfield with us. Follow Eric on Twitter at E. A Warfield 44. Eric, I need some hints and some help here with, with RV maintenance, man, with road trip season around the corner for football. How are you? 
I'm doing well. I tell you what, that, those are that's a fun way to make a trip. <laughs> It is, especially when someone else is driving. <laughs> that is true. You get you a good crew and you're up in an RV, you can have a great time. So you've you've hit uh, you, you've RV'd or, around quite a bit, or have you just been on a few? I wouldn't say quite a bit. I've done a few trips that were uh, that that you know is not as quick as a plane, but you know <laughs> taking take 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 into consideration the amount of fun that you have on that. Well, I won't say on, but inside that RV, yeah, uh, with your friends, just to relax, walk around, stretch out. Um, heck, I mean, it's, it, you're in mobile home, so basically uh, you get to do whatever and just enjoy the moment. So they're fun. So are are you undefeated at poker? Ugh. I wouldn't. I, I'm I'm pretty good. I'm, I'm not bad. Uh, <laughs> about fifty fifty. All right. There we go. No loss. A uh, little bit. A uh, little bit of change in your pocket. There you go. Eric Warfield's with us. Eric, uh, let's start off and and kind of get your reaction to the the last twenty four hours here with uh, the NCAA and their investigation. We heard from Coach Frost. We heard from Trev Alberts, and you know what? Uh, they're working with the NCAA. It, it doesn't seem very major with uh, uh, the the one charge uh, again per brett mcmurphy's story mm-hmm. but you know you're a you're a proud husky you're a proud black shirt what uh, what do you make of this i mean i i mean i spoke earlier and i don't know the full details on the entire story now i do understand that the rules of what ncaa, NCAA allows you um you know who can be at practices mm-hmm. uh um uh, how many you're supposed to have and what so whatsoever but um it does sound like it's a little minor thing, yet these minor things can turn out to be bigger in, in, in the big run. Mm-hmm. And hopefully it doesn't come back to bite us in the ass. Oh, excuse me for my language, but um, and we're just we've been waiting for so long. And you know when you when you hear of situations like this, you, you think to yourself, you know, we're we're, we're never going to, you know, find our way back to the top because we always find you know hit these little pitfalls. Mm-hmm. Uh, but hopefully, like I said, this is just a little minor hiccup. And we can get past it. Um, uh, at least I'm praying that we do. But you know, we've we've got some. Uh, I, I've never had to face any issues like this, and I'm pretty sure they had the same rules when when, when Coach Osborne was around, and mm-hmm. you know all the other previous coaches. I don't know who scheduled something like this or who stepped out of line to to, to take initiative to to be out of, out there on the field. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we've never had any issues like that. Well, I know we used to have our passing league during the summer. Mm-hmm. Coaches weren't allowed to be there, and at no point were they there. You know, we had a, a, a great group of leadership um, with uh, Grant, uh, Tommy. Um, you know, when I first got there, it was most, mostly Tommy, uh, La- uh, Lawrence Phillips, uh, Damian Bennings. Um, man, my memory's so bad. Uh, Tony Velan, mm-hmm. Mike Mentor, those guys that would run the groups. So. Uh, but you had true professionals. I'm not saying that we have that we don't have those of these kids right now, but we had true leadership of guys that, you know, did it on and off the field. So uh, when it came to stuff like that, I think the coach had the most uh utmost respect um from those guys to get to be able to get it done. And uh like again, I don't know what coach decided to, to decide to, to go on the field and uh what analyst decided to go out there and be a part of it or what kind of trouble um it could possibly come back to bite us with, but uh, I'm just hoping it doesn't. Either way, Eric Warfield's with us. Eric, a uh, thought as we, you know, we're less than ten days from from a, a monster opener against Illinois. Do you worry about it uh, affecting that ball game, or do you think Nebraska can can dial in and and be ready to go? Well, hopefully they're not too concerned about it. I mean, whatever happens is going to happen. But the thing is, you still have to be prepared for whatever is you know going to come basically for the worst outcome, you know, because we don't know. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's going to be anything that's to uh, affect us for this coming season anyway. Um, but for the most part, yeah, you just have to be prepared. Like, you're going to go out and play this season the same way before all this uh, interruption started. So uh, I hope we're well prepared for Illinois. Eric, uh, let's uh, spend a, a few minutes here on on some of the, the key guys for, for the Blackshirt defense. And Coach Janander and that group uh, – really got uh, pretty salty as the year went on, specifically when it came to getting better on third down defensively. 
Uh, you still want to see some more TFLs and some some sacks. The pass rush is, is the big question. The Huskers are trying to find uh, that, that corner opposite Cam Taylor-Britt. They've got some young pups that have performed well at safety, and then the, the super seniors that are back with uh, Dismuke and Deontay Williams. Uh, you played safety, you played corner. You know, what type of a season do you think a guy like Williams can have? Like, what kind of year can, can a Dismuke have? They are, they are the brain trust in that, in that back four. And also, spend a second on, on Cam Taylor Britt, a guy that, that has such a bright future beyond Nebraska. Well, I do know that your secondary is going to be as good as your front seven. If you don't have a, a, a great front seven that's putting any kind of pressure on the quarterback, uh, then, you know, the secondary is not going to be able to, to, to hold a guy for so long. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's only so much a, a back can can do. But if you got a, a great front seven, uh, even a, a pretty decent front seven uh, with a good secondary, you're able to go out and make plays. You're, go, you're able to go out and do your job uh, at, a, at a high – at a high intensity. And so I'm hoping that, you know, the front seven is, is, is ball and lights out this year. Uh, yeah, we need that pressure on the quarterback. We need those sacks. We need those tackles for loss. Uh, we need that playmaker out there, that, that leader on defense that can step up when things are, are, are seemingly, you know, like they're going down and, you know, driving the ball down the field. You need that, that one stop, that one big play uh, to get the team amped, you know. And, and right now I haven't seen that within the – within the defense, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can have one of those guys pop out this year uh, that can step up uh, for that leadership role. Eric Warfield's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Eric, when you look at this this stingy secondary, a lot of returning experience, and it sounds like the coaches are pretty bullish on what this secondary could bring. Do you think that's going to allow Coach Shenander and the defensive staff to be able to bring more blitzes from that linebacker spot because those linebackers aren't going to be actually dropping into coverage whenever you have such a great secondary back there? I hope so. Again, I, I, I haven't seen what the defense has done this year. Um, I like the guys that we've gotten so far, especially the kid from Ohio State. Uh, mm-hmm. I've talked to the secondary coach, and, and, you know, he gave high praise to him on his talents, and, uh, you know, whether physically and mentally what he, what he knows of the playbook. Um, so hopefully he can come in and, and, and be an immediate impact. Um, but, again, it's like if, if the front seven, the defensive line and, and linebacker core – it's not stout enough to go out and, and add that pressure, then, you know, there's not a whole lot that you can do as a secondary. Um, you know, you got to make plays, but yet it's going to, you know, bite you in the ass more than, it, than it's going to help you. So uh, I'm just hoping that our front seven is, is, is you know, tuned in, uh, playing on a, on a high level, very intense, and, and just you know, ready to cause some havoc. Eric Warfield, few minutes with us, stalking Nebraska football 2021. We'll get into some NFL in a moment. Uh, you mentioned you, you caught up with Coach Fisher. He has got uh, a, a tremendous room, and, and he runs it uh, with an iron fist and does such a good job of, 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 of getting talent but also developing that talent. And then there's that production board that's uh that i've never seen you just hear about where where guys every day rents do you got to go earn it uh, on the practice field and, and it's always competition what stands out to you about uh what you're hearing with Tariq johnson uh cam taylor Britt? you got newsom and clark also vying for that opposite corner spot but uh if you if you care to share what's uh, what's kind of been the feedback to you from coach fisher Again, he's excited. You know, he, he loves the talent that he has right now. Uh, but you don't really get a lot of uh, emotions out of him. So it's you get the same uh, tone of voice. You don't you don't get excited. I haven't been to watch an actual practice mm. to see uh, how he reacts. I don't as, as far as coaching wise on the field. But just meeting with him in person, you know, he's very leveled out. Uh, understands every single thing that that goes on uh, within the playbook defensively. Um, you know. Probably soon, later on down the uh, few years, he should be a defensive coordinator because guy's uh, very intelligent. Uh, he's, he's played at the highest level. I uh, uh, think he was at St. Louis for a while mm-hmm. in the NFL. So he, he's, he's, uh, he understands a lot. And, and, and from, from what we have right now, uh, again, I'm excited for what the secondary does. Um, the safeties, right uh, – the targeting thing is the one that, that kind of scares me with our safety. <laughs> and I think we had a few games, uh, not even a few, but quite a, there was a lot of them, 
to where uh, the guys are so tuned in and they're so used to making those big hits. And, and then, you know, you you can't slow the game down in those moments when you see, you know, see ball, hit ball, take ball. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're basically just reacting on impact. Uh, so I know in a way that's come, you know, he's got to change some of his coaching to where you're not getting these targeting hits because to take one of those guys out of the game is crucial for us, especially when they're playing so well. But I love the intensity that they bring to the game, though. Tell me a little bit about your experience, and, and Coach Fisher does this with all of his kids, and that's the, they cross-train. You're going to learn safety. Oh, yeah. You're going to learn corner. Did you experience that at, at Nebraska, or is that something that you had to kind of learn on the fly at the NFL? Take me through your, your, uh, your history, if you don't mind, just learning to play corner like you did in the NFL but being a really, really dynamic safety in college. So that was the NFL deal, the, the, the cross training. And I think there are a lot of guys, a lot of coaches are doing that now in college because you can utilize that that free safety to come down and either guard the tight end or guard the nickel. Mm-hmm. And, and it's come to the point to where so many safeties, you're not, you don't have the big bulky guys that are you know, trying to take guys' heads off as they come across the middle. You have more of the athletic type. So they're able to come down and play at the nickel position or cover that tight end um, uh, if needed. And so it helps them to uh, understand more so where these players are going to be at whatever play, of which the safety schools are kind of know that anyway. Um, you know, as far as leverage, uh, how he's, how the, the, the corner is going to be playing on the inside or on the outside, if the receiver split outside the hash or outside the numbers or inside the numbers and how he has to play. So uh, it all plays his part into, you know, I have to know what you're doing and he has to know what I'm doing. But – that's just knowing. Nowadays, it's like, you know, we want to play you at this position because we don't know if we get somebody hurt, and we may have to move a safety down. Mm-hmm. Or we may have to move a cornerback at safety, just, you know, if, if, the, if the safety gets hurt. So it does help when, you, when those guys are able to, you know, uh, cross play and play at either position. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Eric Warfield's with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Eric, uh, I want to go to Scott Frost for a moment, and uh, we're kind of circling this this Illinois game uh, as ginormous. And you know, Nebraska needs momentum; they need something good to happen early in the season. You're, you're... Heck yeah! I mean, we're going into to Oklahoma, and it was the third, fourth game of the season. It, it, it'll, I'm hoping. Yeah, I'm it'll hoping be the we're fourth game by the time we go there. You, you, and the rest of your your friends here in red <laughs> are hoping for undefeated. <laughs> but I, I'm int- You know, you gotta you gotta get out of the the you gotta get out of Champagne alive. And Brett Bielema knows the league, and and he and Lovey left some pretty physical guys. I mean, they they've really been uh, been right there against Nebraska. They smoked Nebraska last year. It was a shootout two years ago in Champaign. So you've got kids that are still left over that, that have had success against Nebraska on Illinois. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, not to, to make too much of it, but it, it, it is huge. And, and I, take me back to 97 with, uh, with that Washington trip. Because uh, nationally, I mean, that was kind of a, a coming out party for Frost and, and you guys where the, the world thought you were good, but you jumped to national title contenders. You eventually won the championship in 97 to send Coach Osborne out. But what do you remember about leading up to that Washington game? Uh, defense played great, but really Scott and the offense, Makovica and, and, and Amon, I mean, he just kind of ran all over Washington on the offensive side of the ball. You see any parallels there? Am I just – talking out of my backside i mean first off uh for me to avoid the washington question you know illinois is first on our list yeah and so again no matter what happens with this investigation that's going on no matter what happens mm-hmm. where we're whether we've lost a game whether we're undefeated or we've lost two games going into oklahoma illinois is the first game on our on our on our, on our list on our schedule take that task at hand focus there and go into there 100 percent focused on getting a w in Illinois, Champaign Stadium. Uh, so you can't control what's happening now with the investigation. What's happened has happened. Right now, you have to get have to make sure these kids are prepared, and they're not concerned about what happened with the summer uh, and the practices and who was there and who was what was supposed to be there. 
Your mission right now is to go and beat Illinois. Uh, you, you've already lost to them, so yes, you have a, pro, a, a point to prove. Even if you didn't lose them, you still have a point, a point to prove that this is your season. And so for Scott as a coach, you want to try to win every game. One game at a time, so right now that focus is Illinois. And I know that, that Washington game for us at the time, we did have a point to prove because, you know, we had come from back-to-back national championships and to losing the one, uh, the two games in the one season with, with Arizona State and, and the Texas. So, yeah, we knew we were the better team, and we had still ended up losing that year. Uh, so we knew we had a, a point to prove going into the 97 season. So uh, having them rank higher than us, we loved it. You know, it just gave us that much more momentum, that much more uh, bite to go out and, and, and to, to, to prove a point that we were the best team. Eric Warfield's with us. Hale Varsity Radio. A couple minutes here, Eric. What's your outlook on the Chiefs? Uh, another Super Bowl run in them? Uh, do you like Tim? It sounds so easy, right? I mean, two in a, two years in a row, three straight AFC championships. Tell me about your Chiefs here with Mahomes and company. I know it's a little different looking Kansas City. Uh, a little bit uh, different look on the offensive tackle Open side of things. Yeah. yeah, on the O-line and then uh, you still got Tariq, you still got Kelsey, you still got Mahomes, but how are you feeling about KC? You know what? Uh, Veach has done a good job of keeping our core units together. You know, we've, we kept their key pieces. The offensive line was hurt, and, and it was shown in, on the biggest stage there is. So to be embarrassed out there, for you know, granted, I still won't take anything from Tom Brady. To me, the best quarterback to have ever done it. Mm-hmm. But, man, there's no way that they should have won that game the way they did. Mm-hmm. So I think that we addressed the, the right uh, issues in, in the draft all season. We've upgraded heavily on the offensive line, got great uh, backups, so depth there. And I think we added some young uh, linebackers to where, you know, we were kind of missing in areas also. Uh, I like the kid from Missouri. Uh, I like Gary. And from what I've, had, what I've heard, as far as, uh, you know, from the beat writers, and, you know, they're filling in quite nicely. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only thing that's a concern of mine right now is, uh, well, I forget the kid's name at, at uh, Seattle that just signed the big contract. Adam, is it Jamal? Jamal Adams, yeah. But everybody's got Tyron Matthew voted as the number one safety and his contract is up. So far, going to look for something bigger than that, obviously. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know we spoke, I saw something on the ESPN yesterday that, you know, we don't have the cash right now, so he's got to be patient. So that's that's gonna, you know, I don't. I hope mentally it doesn't have an effect on Tyron because he knows he's, he's gonna get the money eventually. Um, so if he's focused on this season, uh, man, we we could be a very very dangerous team. And, you know, the offense is always fun to watch. Mm-hmm. You never know what to get from Mahomes. You never know uh, what to get from Kelsey and Tariq, but you know it's gonna be something exciting. Um, it's just a matter of. Has our defense made the, the, the right upgrades to, to complement the, the offense? And, you know, adding, uh, well, I, would, I wouldn't say adding, but having Chris Jones being able to play the defensive end and, you know, shift around from defensive end to, to defensive tackle is going to be a scary sight to see for a lot of offensive uh, linemen. You know, Aaron Donald's done it with, with, with the Rams, and I'm not saying that Chris is, is like Aaron, but he, I know he's one of the top three interior linemen. So to have that guy coming off the edge is going to be is going to cause some fear. So, well, I'm I'm excited to see what's going to happen. You know, I, I like what Cleveland has done to their team, the upgrades that they've made. So, you know, I think that's a early play for us in the season. Um, but you really can't tell what to get from both teams that early in the season. But I still think that we have the better team going into this year. Well, I think a a 2.0 of of Sue and Levante and. Uh, Bruce Arians, and, and of course your guy Tom Brady uh, versus Kansas City would be a lot of fun. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> give, me, give, me, give me a Chiefs-Tampa uh, rematch. I would love to see it. You know, just to prove the point that we weren't as bad as we showed last year, but that doesn't matter right now because uh, Tampa's already got the rings to prove that they were the better team. Eric Warfield with us, Husker standout Hall of Famer and uh, 10-year NFL vet with Kansas City and New England. Eric, we'll do this again, and uh, thanks for a few minutes, man. Always good to chat with you, bud. All right, Chris. You have a good time, man. Got to love Eric Warfield. Good stuff on Frost, on Nebraska, on the Chiefs, 
on Illinois. Reminder about buckling up. Uh, There's over 1,500 crashes each year in Nebraska involving an impaired driver. Driving drunk, buzzed, or high, never acceptable. Law enforcement officers are working every day to stop it before any more people are killed or injured. If you're going to drive, don't drink. If you do drink, designate a sober driver or get a ride share. A DUI costs more than you think. Brought to you by the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. So, good stuff today. Podcast. We tell you about the podcast all the time. And you got a family of podcasts with Hale Varsity. The uh, Straight Up Breakdown podcast with Greg Smith. Of course, uh, Brandon Vogel. The I-80 preview is cranked back up. The uh, Mind Your Own podcast with Aaron Sorensen. We talked to Aaron yesterday. Of course, Jacob Padilla and uh, Damon Benning with the Prep Podcast, the Varsity Club Podcast with Derek Peterson. Dr. Petey with us tomorrow. And, of course, Hail Varsity Radio. Find us, subscribe to us, Google, Spotify, iTunes. Give us a rating, good, bad, or ugly. We'll wind down a Thursday next. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time, great to be with you. Hail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. You know what? Everyone can use a good soak. And the place to be, Home Innovation Spas, get that hot tub, get that swim spa, get that cold tub when you make these at 4,000%. Deb the Spa Lady's with us, and you can find her 20th and Highway 2 in Lincoln off Industrial Road in Omaha. Log on, spasonline.com. Deb, you are, you are getting set for a corn dog or two. Oh, you know it. I am. And the whole the fair starts next well, let's see, a week a week from tomorrow. Yes. So a week from tomorrow, we will be opening up the Nebraska State Fair, and this will be our 30th year at the fair. So actually, the first day of the fair, they've designated as the Home Innovation Spa's first day, 30th year of the fair. Wow. So it's pretty exciting to have it. So you've been after. designated. That is yes, awesome. we are designated. And the cool thing is we've got – Four truckloads of spas headed our way as we speak. So if you are wanting a spa and you don't want to wait, you know, months and months or a year in some cases, you got to be out there first thing Friday morning or you need to be at one of our stores Friday because we will be honoring those state fair specials at the stores and at the fair. You know what? Fair pricing always exists, but super duper fair pricing, a reality a week from tomorrow. That's right. Super duper fair prices. So all we, we're always fair, but these are even fairer. So that is awesome. Come see us. Well, and you, 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 just to, to make sure folks heard it right, you said truck loads of spas yes. on the yes. way. And uh, you know what? You're going to get a corn dog and get some, some, some fried cheese, and you're going to sit in the spa and test it out. <laughs> and I think the weather, I kind of looked out to the, the next Friday, mm-hmm. Thursday, Friday, Saturday time frame, and it's really not, in the 80s. So it's, it doesn't look like it's going to be unbearably hot. Hopefully not full of rain like we had a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. So uh, come out to the fair. It is so nice in Grand Island. They have done such a wonderful job. Everything's so new and fresh, and they have. It, it is really fun. And so if you haven't made it out there, you need to come out and take a look. Absolutely. And uh, we were out in Central Nebraska on Tuesday doing a show in Kearney. And uh, mm-hmm. a lot of listeners out there. So, yeah, Carney Hastings, Grand Island. Go see Deb the Spa Lady at the fair. If you're in Lincoln or, or, or wherever you hear us in the state, go see Deb. Make your way to the fair. Get some food, see a concert, and go home with a spa. I mean, that sounds like a plan to me. I like it. I think it's a great idea. And, you know, a lot of people will wait all year long to come to the fair to buy a hot tub. Well, so, it's the time. Definitely. Time is now. And... 
first come, first serve has taken on a whole new meaning. You don't even have to, to like you know, knock down seven barrels or hit four free throws. You just go say, no. Dad, give me fair pricing. No. It's a winner. You don't. Nothing. Nothing like that. Well, go see. We make it easy. You do, and it's been 30 years and counting. Deb the Spa Lady Home Innovation Spa. See her at the fair, the state fair, uh, starting next Friday. Deb, we'll talk soon. We'll talk again next week. Thanks for jumping okay. on with us. Sounds great. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye. Right. We love Deb the Spa Lady. Back tomorrow at 4 on Hale Varsity. Thanks.